Dr. Lin will wrap us up. He's the director of our adult congenital heart disease program. And we've asked him as the field of PFO closure is also evolving rapidly to come talk to us about PFO closure as the needle swung. Thanks, Huey. Okay, so these are my disclosures. Um, so specifically, um, I am a speaker for Gore and we were a major part of the reduced trial. So I know a lot of the details about the reduced trial. Um, uh, in, uh, and I'm more familiar with that because we were a part of it. And then I'm gonna be the PI for the post-approval study here locally. Um, so these are the objectives. So I'm gonna to try to define a little bit about cryptogenic stroke and PFO-related uh, stroke. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the current clinical trial data supporting PFO closure and then where things are gonna go um, next. Um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the importance of really getting a thorough workup um, when you're looking at a PFO and a possible cryptogenic stroke related to that and how to rule out PF no. This is a new term that I learned. So basically when there's not actually a PFO there. And then finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about the complications, some of the strange things that came out of the reduce and the respect trial as far as the complications of PFO closure. So let's start off with the case. So very typical situation. This is a 35-year-old woman, um, this typical situation in our world, um, who presented with facial droop and unilateral weakness after a long car trip. Um, she was brought to a stroke center and given TPA with immediate improvement of her uh, symptoms. And when she was safe enough to get a brain MRI, she was confirmed to have diffusion-weighted uh, changes on her brain imaging. And then ultimately she underwent a transthoracic echo with a positive bubble study. So what is that about? So let's talk about cryptogenic stroke and PFO. Um, so here's the problem uh, um, with cryptogenic stroke. So cryptogenic stroke represents about 200,000 strokes annually. And, um, oops, this is kind of going the wrong order here. But, uh, and then the other part of the problem is that PFOs represent about 25% of the population. So just by virtue of the sheer numbers, you're gonna have uh, potential overlap. So the question is mechanistically, which patients who happen to have a PFO and happen to have a cryptogenic stroke are the ones who actually have a cryptogenic stroke because of the PFO, because those are the patients that you really want to treat, right? Because at the end of the day, it could just be coincidence. So a cryptogenic stroke is also known as an embolic stroke of undetermined source, or ESUS. And you may have heard recently that there's some interesting data brewing about how to actually treat ESUS, because it turns out our traditional method of just purely anticoagulating all of them may not actually be the best, uh, best idea. But the truth of the matter is this is very frequent. In fact, it actually represents 20% of all ischemic strokes. So when we take these two large populations, there is going to be just some coincidental overlap in the Venn diagrams. So the real question is within that overlap of the Venn diagrams, who are the patients who are going to benefit from PFO closure? So then I show this age curve. And really, the ones that we want to probably get at are the ones that are younger, because they really have no other reason to actually have stroke. So their cryptogenic stroke and their PFO are probably more likely to be mechanistically related. Now, there's a paradox to that, and that is that patients who are younger with stroke are also the ones who are less likely to have a recurrent stroke. And you'll see why that becomes a real serious problem when we start to try to study this and get behind the science to justify treatment for this. So the idea of the cryptogenic stroke with PFO and the, and the mechanism behind it is this, the idea that you have a clot that arises from the venous circulation and then travels through the patent foramen valley, which is a connection from the right atrium to the left atrium through em embryologically normal communication within the septum. And so basically it's a flap that exists during your fetal development that allows you to actually get oxygenated blood flow to your brain and your heart in a critical part of your development. So 100% of us actually have a PFO at birth. Then within a few days, about 75% of us, the PFO actually will completely seal over, whereas about 25% of us, that PFO can continue to open up intermittently. And mechanistically, the idea is that a thrombus from the venous circulation can travel across that PFO. So this is where things stand right now. So this is, these are the guidelines from the American Stroke Association in 2014. And here highlighted is class three. For patients with cryptogenic extreme stroke or TIA and a PFO without evidence of DAVT, available data do not support a benefit for PFO closure, class three. Okay, And so that's where things exist in the guidelines right now. And that hasn't changed since 2014. But now there's some evolving data that should hopefully support a change in those guidelines. So I'm going to talk about that. So because there's a whole myriad of studies and a whole myriad of um, retrospective studies that get very confusing, I'm gonna to try to focus on just two of the major landmark studies that have happened primarily in the United States recently and have really driven the changes in the FDA uh, labeling 
uh, for PF occlusion. The first one is the RESPECT trial, and the second one is the REDUCE trial. The reason why they're important is because they're the two devices that are actually approved for PF occlusion. The first one being made by Abbott, obviously, and the second one being made by Gore. So these are the key differences in the study design. And it's really interesting because when you actually, when we go back to this about 10 years from now, this will be a really great um, um, uh, case study in how to and how not to design a study when you learn about the population. So in the RESPECT trial, it was a one-to-one -one randomization of device, to, uh, device versus medical therapy, and it was, there was no blinding that occurred. Um, the clinician was able to specify the medication, so whether it was warfarin versus aspirin versus Plavix for their medical therapy. So there was a huge amount of heterogeneity uh, between the patients who were treated medically. And then if they were actually randomized to device therapy, they were mandated to have aspirin and Plavix for 30 days. I'm sorry, clobidogrel for 30 days. And then what was also interesting was that patients with the DVT were also, with the DVT history were also enrolled. On the other hand, in the REDUCE study um, by Gore, it was a two to one device versus medi medicine randomization. So in other words, you are twice as likely to be randomized to device therapy versus medical therapy. Um, there was a very clear and very specific antiplatelet regimen for both medical therapy as well as the um, device therapy side. Um, and there was no anti therapeutic anticoagulation allowed. So any uh, situation where the patient required uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, the patient was excluded. So they had a known VTE, they were excluded from the study. So it's interesting because that actually will shape what we find. So both of them were probably some of the longest studies that have ever been conducted. So it's incredible that the RESPECT study required up to 13 years of study to, in order to actually make significance. And that comes back to this problem, which is that young patients have a low recurrence risk. So if you have to have your first stroke to be enrolled, you have to wait until the patients have another event to have a second um, endpoint because uh, your primary endpoint because otherwise you have no significance and what I'll show you in a minute is that every single patient counts and the uh, reduced study was no different it took about seven years to finish the reduced study as well and enrollment was slow because most patients didn't want to be randomized they were actually able to find operators who would close their PFO off label and then just, this is just a focus on the fact that we're going to focus now on just clinical strokes that had um, imaging documentation, because that's really the endpoint that I think is a hard endpoint that we can look at. So um, these are the respect um, efficacy endpoints. And again, we're going to focus on recurrent ischemic stroke. So here's the bottom line. In the device arm, and this is in the long-term uh, study of respect, because the initial intention to treat anal analysis was negative. 18 patients with device had recurrent stroke, and that represents 3.6% recurrence rate. In the medical arm, 28 patients had stroke, and that represents 5.8%. And that reached uh, p-value 0.046, okay, so, so just barely significant. So you can imagine if you messed up on one of these patients. So for example, two of these patients actually were randomized to device, but had a stroke before they actually had a device implanted. So they were counted as a stroke within the device arm, and that made the initial p-value negative. So you can see how tight this is. And you can see that the absolute risk reduction is only 2.2%. So the margin is very, very small. You think maybe reduce is different? It's not. It actually echoes almost identical. So in the device arm, the recurrence rate is about 1.4% stroke, six events in the device arm. In the medical arm, 12 events, 5.4%. And again, the absolute risk reduction is single digits, 4%. Okay. But this was a little bit more significant. And I think in part that's because the, the design of the study was a two to one randomization to device. Okay? So what does it look like when we put it all together? So about 2.2% in respect, about 4% absolute risk reduction. So these margins are razor thin, which means that your accomplishment with these cases have to be absolutely perfect. There can be no negative outcomes to your procedures or else you're pretty much taking away the benefit to PFO closure in these patients. And then, of course, the other thing that's really remarkable is it's 0.58 events per year, 0.39 events per year in the device arms on both sides, one event per year in the medical arm, 1.7 uh, event per year in the medical arm for reduce. So really low event rates. So the key is long term, which is why at the end of the day, if you treat a young patient who has these low event rates, they're probably going to benefit over the course of 40 to 50 years because when you start looking at what medical therapy looks like over 40 years, now you see a problem, right? If you multiply 1.7 events per year over 40 years, 
that is a serious problem. Whereas if you close somebody who is, say, 65, they may not necessarily benefit the same way. Now both devices are FDA approved based upon this literature. So when we look at these patients, this is an extremely important part of their workup. This is called the ROPE score, which is the risk of paradoxical embolism. And again, there's some paradox to this. And the main driver for the, this is basically understanding if you have a stroke and you have a PFO, what is the likelihood that your PFO is actually the mechanistic cause of your stroke? And it's really just a percentage, okay? There's, it's not actually a causal reality, okay? And basically the main driver of this is the comorbidities associated with ischemic stroke, and then also age. So if your age is younger and you have no other comorbidities, your ROPE score is higher. But paradoxically, that also means that your risk of recurrent stroke with medical therapy is lower. So that's a little bit of a problem in this field. So this is what our workup looks like when we look at a patient who has PFO and a cryptogenic stroke. So typically, we want to have imaging confirmation of stroke, because the problem is sometimes patients with complex migraines can present with these ischemic type of symptoms. We always mandate a consultation from our stroke service so they can help us to guide what is the best timing and what is the best therapy, whether it's medical versus device versus a combination thereof. We always ask for head and neck imaging to prove that there's no um, ar uh, arterial involvement, no atherosclerotic involvement. And one thing that I've found along the way is that many of these patients are actually subject to um, arterial dissections as a cause of their cryptogenic strokes, and they're not identified until we get detailed head and neck imaging. Um, and then we also want to have a definitive demonstration of the PFO, because every so often we'll get the PF no, and I'll show you an example of that. And then finally, we require some type of monitoring to rule out occult atrial fibrillation as a cause of their stroke. <coughs> so this is the PF no. So a positive bubble study doesn't always equal a PFO. And I think for those who are imagers out there, I really want to emphasize this. And I'll show you two cases where this is a problem. So the first case was a 23-year-old 23 23 man who had uh, presented with right-sided weakness and was found to have a cerebral abscess. Um, he initially ended up going for a TE and had a bubble study that was positive. But then when he came back, he actually had a transthoracic bubble study that was negative. So what's going on with that? Well, it turns out venography will show you everything if you do it from the left arm. And this is what he had. So what's this? That's right. I hear somebody whispering. So this is a persistent left-sided SVC unroofed to the left atrium, so uh, with an unroofed coronary sinus in the left atrium. And so how we treated this with, was with an amplastic vascular plug through the left internal jugular vein. We were able to occlude that obligatory right-to-left shunt. So that's why you may end up getting a positive bubble study on one day and a negative bubble study on the other. So that's why it's important when you do a bubble study that you comment on which arm you're injecting through. This is another one. So this is really interesting. So this is TEE, where the bubble study is positive. Then when we do the ICE, we're getting bubbles through the pulmonary vein in the left atrium, but not in the right atrium. Why is that? Well, that's because this patient has pulmonary AVMs. And if you look at the angiography, you can see it just runs right through the pulmonary vasculature without actually stopping through the, um, uh, the microvasculature. So let's talk briefly, now that we've talked about PFO closure, about it um, and what the complications are. So how does this get done? Well, typically we get bilateral venous access. And I'll skip through this pretty quickly because um, I'm running out of time. Um, and this is what it looks like when we actually do the workup. So this is the, a true PFO. You can see very clearly that's a real PFO. And then when we actually go to the intracardiac echo, you can see what it looks like once we put the wire across the PFO and how there's continuous shunting once we put the wire across. And then finally, this is what it looks like when we implant the device. So this happens to be a gore septal occluder. So the reality is were that, were that event, adverse events were actually rare. Um, but there were a couple things that came out in the signal that were a little bit strange. And the first one was, uh, let's look at the REDUCE study. Oops. Um, in the REDUCE study, what was interesting was there were actually a significant number of atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter events. And this is something that's probably going to require a little bit more scrutiny down the line, especially as we start to look at potentially older patients as part of the post-approval study, but then also to start to look at the long-term events with this device. Um, it's still not entirely clear why you have such a high signal from this standpoint. Um, interestingly, there was a higher number of atrial fibrillation events in the RESPECT study as well, but not significantly. What was strange, though, was that they did have a higher number of venous thromboembolic events um, in the device closure arm that actually uh, reached significance. Why this is the case is still not clear, except it may have to do with the fact that they did happen to enroll patients who could have had a VTE in the past. 
So in summary, what I've told you about is defining PFO-related stroke and how the two may not necessarily be related, may just be coincidental. And identifying the people who are mechanistically PFO-related stroke is really critical. I told you about the really razor-thin margins between 2 to 4% absolute risk reduction with PFO closure versus medical therapy. Um, I told you a little bit about the importance of really doing a thorough workup for prior to PFO closure and ruling out the other causes of a positive bubble study. And then finally, I told you a little bit about some of the strange things that we found in PFO closure that will bear a little bit more scrutiny down the line. Um, but the fact that generally there's low complication rate. So for those of you who are interested in learning more about adult congenital heart disease, we have the Adult Congenital Heart Symposium in about three weeks here at the same location. There is flyers outside, and we welcome you to join us. Thank you.